1907. A believer in social Darwinism, Rupin developed a rationale for Jewish settlements that sought to get rid of the Semitic elements of the Jewish race, by which he meant their Arab history and culture, for the purpose of transplanting a European Jewishness to Palestine, where, through principles of self-sufficiency, it might be effectively preserved. So the first, very first cooperative farms were based on these proposals of Oppenheimer and Rupin. The first and second aliyahs to the region were fundamentally structured by these ideas, and only with the third aliyah, which took place in 1918 through 23, did socialism enter the framework. Peterberg is joined by many scholars of this period in concluding, and I quote, that the kibbutz was first and foremost a colonizing tool for the formation of a settler project, end quote. He cites Gershon Shafir from the University of California at San, Di San Diego, whose work on comparative settler colonialism is key to this argument. Shafir writes, and I quote, the national character of the kibbutz was its foundation and raison d'etre and, and determined its composition and in part its structure. The, the kibbutz became the most homogenous body of Israeli society. It included almost exclusively Eastern European Jews since it was unwilling to embrace Middle Eastern and North African Jews and was constructed on the exclusion of Palestinian Arabs, end quote. I would, I would, I would add, and the labor of Palestinian la Arabs as well. If some of these Eastern European members of the kibbutz were anarchists or, or Marxists, did their presence contravene those fundamental tenets of nationalism and colonization, or were they simply accommodated, if not contained, by the kibbutzim movement? For those contemporary anarchists who seek to recall the anarchists of the kibbutz movement as important political predecessors for their own activism, it makes sense to ask whether those forms of nationalist local community, racially exclusive, were aptly prefiguring Rather, the right-wing settler movement, not the contemporary anarchist movement. The effort to find predecessors for contemporary Israeli anarchism among the socialist and anarchist members of the early kibbutz movement, um, a movement with clearly national and colonizing aims, suggests that anarchist aims are separable from anti-colonial struggles. And I would hope that this is simply not true and not feasible. This leads me back to one of the questions with, with which I began. Namely, whether there can be an anti-statist anarchism that unwittingly mobilizes the prerogatives of citizenship at the same time that it reproduces a certain nationalism. Gordon points out that Bakunin distinguished between forms of nationalism produced by the state and other forms of sociability or modes of belonging that, um, that uh, are variously described as natural or organic communities. Of course, there are all kinds of reasons to be suspicious of natural communities. I have my worries there. Um, um, but what I am interested in here is whether the distinction between a nationalism produced and sustained by a state is absolutely distinct from forms of communitarian belonging that are understood to form either in opposition to the state or to the side of its operations. Gordon himself remarks, that the issue of nationalism in the national liber liberation struggles of stateless peoples received far less attention from anarchists in the past. My sense is that the ideal of a local or global community is important to anarchist mobilizations, not only as a way of countering state-centered forms of nationalism, but also as a way of resisting forms of atomistic individualism required and reproduced by capitalism. But to the extent that the forms of communitarian belonging depend on a solidarity among Israelis who commit civil disobedience or put their bodies on the line and at risk as they oppose Israeli militarization, they can perhaps unwittingly become forms of solidarity among Israeli leftists or dissenters who are actually bound together by their internal opposition to the state. Of course, there are modes of solidarity among local Palestinians and Israeli leftists that have clearly and effectively been formed in Budris, in Bilin, in Hebron, and several other villages. And those are often invoked as instances of a radical potential for cohabitation and coexistence, at least for struggling together. The same has been said about certain figures, such as Giuliano Mercamus 
the former director of the Freedom Theater in Janine, assassinated a month ago, described as 100% Jewish and 100% Palestinian, a virtual embodiment for many, a living form of binationalism and bilingualism. Many have pointed to the important work of Andalus, the Hebrew-Arabic publishing operation that brought Arabic literature to the Israeli public. Some also understandably point to the existence of bilingual schools and villages as signs of hope, instances of cohabitation that undo the claims of nationalism and defy the explicit aims of the state. Others look to seeds of peace or bereavement groups like, um, I believe it's called Counterpoint, which gather Israelis and Palestinians, those who are allowed to travel and who speak English, and so a very small minority, into dialogue. I want to suggest that no matter how moving and important some of these coexistence projects may be, they remain sporadic and and isolated as long as their work fails to address the concrete legal, military, and economic means by which the discrimination against Palestinian Israelis is maintained within the borders, the denial of all political rights to self-determination continues under occupation, and the rights of Palestinian refugees forcibly dispossessed in 48 uh, remain dishonored. If the structure of occupation remains the same, if Israeli citizenship is not democratized for all of its inhabitants, and if the rights of refugees continue to be um, uh, ignored, then cohabitation becomes a transient moment eclipsed time and again by these overwhelming structural realities. And if one calls for cohabitation or even peace without addressing these structural inequalities of settler colonialism, then I think one runs the risk of trying to instate a form of coexistence that by definition is not sustainable and whose transitory and exceptional qualities confirm rather than contest the functioning of political power. When Palestinian activists claims that there can be no peace without justice, no coexistence without the end of occupation, They are, I believe, articulating how the call to peace and cohabitation as ethical ideals can work precisely to deflect from the political and economic realities of occupation and in that way support their operation and the effect of their inevitability. On the other hand, those very ethical ideals um, can become substantially realized only once uh, a movement is is articulated and organized in such a way to oppose those very political and economic realities of domination. This comes up uh, time and again um, when people discuss boycott, divestment, and sanctions. There are those who believe that the cultural and intellectual dom- domain should be safeguarded as the site where Israelis and Palestinians might freely exchange views, come to appreciate each other's perspectives and engage in civil discourse. This is touted as the civil society alternative. The problem, of course, is that such a conjecture assumes that there is a symmetry between Israeli and Palestinian positions, or asks each of them to enter into dialogue through suppressing the fact that this symmetry does not exist. In this sense, dialogues that function on this basis institute and ratify a structure of disavowal, an especially problematic move um, on the part of Israel, um, um, uh, especially a systematic devowal, um, 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 especially when what is disavowed uh, is precisely what is happening on the other side of the wall or indeed at the wall itself. One reason that symmetry does not exist is that no major university or cultural institution in Israel is willing to speak out against the occupation. This means that whenever an artist or intellectual from outside of Israel comes to such an institution as its guest, they not only effectively make the claim, it does not matter if you fail to oppose the occupation, I will come and visit you and shore up your cultural legitimacy anyway. And for some of us, to arrive on an Israeli campus is effectively to declare oneself against the boycott and to be used precisely for that purpose by the administration or the government, which is one reason some of us do not go and will not go. In other words, the problem with this mm, uh, civil society version of coexistence is that it assumes a diluted Kantianism that claims, hey, we are all people here, There's basic respect between us. 
That strategy seeks to cast as an ethical relation between equals a situation in which the domination of one group over another is denied and deflected. So if one agrees to that mode of dialogue and equality, then one effectively agrees to put out of sight and out of mind the existing political reality of either second-class citizenship within the existing borders or no citizenship at all outside those borders. Now, against this view, one could argue that only through local instances of living together or ta'ayush is binationalism brought into being. This happens through the practices of ordinary life. And this is a view that assumes it must be, that binationalism must be practiced first in smaller communities and local sites in order finally to expand in ever-widening circles to build an alternative ethos. For anarchists, this alternative ethos could be a stateless society or one in which certain communitarian ideals of communism are realized through daily practice. I accept the point that sometimes local changes do actually build over time and space and come to present an alternative ethos, an alternative form of sociability. But if such forms of sociability fail to contest an existing state structure, then they can become cultural alibis for the state itself. This happens when a state can point to examples of free and open exchange among people otherwise in conflict as possible within its own terms. If the occup occupation permits of such moments of coexistence, then the occupation does not need to change and is not really so bad after all. In fact, we can now even point to its humanity. Of course, the anarchists against the wall are not only building new modes of sociability, often between Israelis and Palestinians, especially in Bimin, but also, quite literally, opposing the state, intervening to halt or derail its militarized expansion. And this is a crucial activity, critical, radical, and exemplary in the way that it seeks both to build a new ethos and stop the wall, which is the state, as we know, as it destroys the livelihood of Palestinians, their villages and their lands, their access to water, to medical facilities, to family and work on the other side of the barrier. But this form of alliance seems to come up against a limit precisely when the question emerges whether anarchists can or should support the Palestinian national struggle if that struggle is for a Palestinian state of their own. I want to turn to this issue um, briefly be before I return to the question of alliance and, and solidarity, um, which is where my paper belatedly takes a queer turn. Uri Gordon formulates this paradox in Israeli anarchism when he writes, for instance, and I quote, while anarchists surely can do something more specific in solidarity with Palestinians than just saying that we need a revolution, any such action would appear hopelessly contaminated with a statist agenda, end quote. He discusses various alternatives. Anarchists could, following Kropotkin, consider the state as a necessary strategic move but one which would have to be dissolved in the future. Or one could say that given that Palestinians are already under state control, they might as well have their own state even though the state cannot legitimately represent their final aspirations. Or one could say, as Gordon himself seems to say, that anarchists can take action in support of the dignity and livelihood of Palestinians without reference to the question of statehood." End quote. In some ways, what uh, Gordon suggests here is a perfect strategy, since it restricts the role of activists to supporting Palestinians without intervening in the question of whether or not a state should be built or what mode of governance is most desirable. But is this really enough? Does this strategy stay restricted within the national frame and fail to really find out how Palestinians are framing their struggle and what it might be then to support them? It's interesting to me that the ethical principles in defense of which anarchists would then struggle are restricted to dignity and livelihood.